Hello and welcome to Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. We're in Module 8, Ethical Practices and Learning Analytics. And we're working our way toward the end. Still got a little ways to go. We're in the second part of our discussion of agency and the role agency plays in our creation of ethical practices in learning analytics. In the previous video, I talked quite a bit about different conceptions of agency and how these change how we think about ethics uh, in general and ethics in relation to AI and analytics. And I, I gave four basic conceptions of agency. This is neither uh, exhaustive nor inclusive. Agency might include these four, might include other things. These might not be the best ways of talking about the conceptions of agency. But the main intent here is to get across the idea that we can think of agency in different ways. Uh, we can think of it in terms of power or the outcomes, either in power in the sense of pushing or making things happen, or power in the sense of creating limitations on what we can do. We can think of it in terms of competences, uh, our capacities to do things. We can think of it in terms of how we feel about ourselves, what we can do, our place in the world, etc. Or we can think of agency as ownership, taking ownership over our actions, taking credit where it's due, etc. Uh, these conceptions and others similar to it can be found in a lot of the discussions of agency. Um, just as uh, an example of that, I've uh, put up here a diagram from Gail Jenkins from 2019 looking at teacher agency the effects of passive and active responses to curriculum change, things like self-reflectiveness, intentionality, forethought, reactiveness. We can see how these conceptions of agency can be seen to play uh, different roles in our understanding of teacher agency. I also talked about how our understanding of what learning is has an influence over our understanding of the role that agency plays. And I, I mentioned Ben Word, Wordmuller's article from, uh, well, I guess it's yesterday now, uh, 16 hours ago, <laughs> uh, on the performative demonstration of education, which is uh, what a lot of the content-based uh, ideal based models of learning look like or are based on. Um, they're more about the education provider, whether it's a company or a school or an institution, proving that some content has been learned than it is about whether the learner actually learns anything. The contrast here was with uh, what I call free learning or personal learning where the individual themselves, the learners themselves, are in control of the learning. And this is significant because when we think of the relation between ethics and agency, the more agency you have over your own learning, the more the ethics of that learning is in your own control. Um, but if all of the agency is in the hands of the institution or the teacher or the artificial intelligence providing the learning, then the ethics of these becomes much more important. The ethics of the institution, the teacher, or the AI providing the learning becomes crucial. So that's where we left off. In this part of the presentation, I want to look at a bit about where learning or where agency comes from. But before that, just to underline the point, um, let's begin looking ever so briefly 
about the subject of science literacy. And this underlines the point about the ethics and the agency. So this is Ethan Siegel writing back in 2021, in other words, a few days ago. Um, and he could be talking about the chart that I just showed. He writes, for decades, we've been mistakenly measuring science literacy by measuring which specific facts people have memorized. Instead, developing an awareness of and an appreciation for science and what it does for society is a far more impactful approach. Science is our best tool for separating what is true from what is not, and we abandon it at our own peril as a society. Now, he's talking about science and science literacy, but I interpret this in terms of agency and who is actually able to be responsible and indeed ethically responsible for uh, determining what is true and what is not true. If it's all the artificial intelligence or the teacher or the institution, then we're placing on them the onus of determining what is true and what is not true. And that makes the ethics of that determination significant. Uh, if on the other hand, it's up to individuals uh, to develop for themselves the capacity through science. And I'm not talking about making stuff up here, but through science, through an appreciation of science, through uh, the application of scientific method for themselves, uh, whatever that may be, um, then we're removing the need to be so ethically stringent on the part of educations and information providers. I know it sounds like kind of a slippery argument here, but part of the argument here is along the lines of where would you rather have that ethical responsibility based? Would you rather put it in the hands of the institutions and the artificial intelligences? Or would you rather put it in the hands of individuals? And indeed, forget about science for a second. Just think about literacy generally, right? Um, if we remove all the choice from people and tell them what to memorize, they're not ethically responsible for what they know at all. And so they're not ethically responsible for what they believe. They're not ethically responsible for how they vote they don't really have any agency. Um, and that's why they're not ethically responsible. Um, all of the responsibility now falls into the hands of these agencies. And it's arguable that these agencies aren't actually capable of having ethics. Argue, and I'm not. I'm not saying I'm making that argument here, but it's an argument worth considering. Um, certainly, if you believe that only humans can have ethical standing, then you're probably not happy about institutions and machines telling you what's true and what's not true. Possibly, you're not even happy about the institution of science telling you what's true and what's not true. That can also lead to bad consequences. So, you know, it's not going to be a nice, simple picture that we're talking about here. But certainly, the ethics and the agency of one's capacity to deal with facts and information about the world are closely tied together. And you can't really separate them. Okay, pause for effect. Where does this agency come from, really? I mean, without the hand waviness. Well, a lot of people think that it comes from biology. Um, and there's an argument for that. But 
let's suppose we agree that it comes from biology. Um, you know, let, let's suppose that it is our nature, whatever that is, um, that gives us the capacity of agency, however we construe that. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we could go back to the old belief, desire, intention model. And that's basically the approach that people like Alan Newell um, and, and Herbert Simon and others took. Newell introduced the idea of what might be called the control system. Or these days, we think of it as the executive function. And the executive function uh, is what actually controls agency for us. And the various aspects of the executive function would include things like activation, focus, effort, emotion, memory, and action. Um, but then there's another way of looking at this where uh, there isn't actually uh, a mechanism of decision or control that exists. And we'll draw up the analogy here with evolution. Because that's a way we can make a similar sort of mistake. So evolution we think of as the survival of the fittest right um so we get stories like um the bird developed its wings so it could escape predators now i don't know if that's a real story or not okay we'll just take that as a sample story substitute an actual real story the argument will still work um so we can certainly say that the bird having wings right we can certainly say having wings definitely gives you a survival advantage because it definitely makes it easier to escape uh, predators. So, yeah, seems like a pretty good explanation, right? Uh, survival of the fittest means that things that are able to escape predators more effectively are more likely to survive and more likely to pass on their genes. So, they're more likely to pass on wing-growing genes. Makes sense. But let's go back to that original formulation. Um, birds developed wings so they could become more effective at avoiding predators. Now, there's this aspect of intentionality here that isn't actually present in evolution. There's a suggestion. It's only implicit. But I think it's taken as literal by a lot of people. I could be wrong, but I think it is. Where it's some sort of action that birds took, some sort of decision that birds made to develop wings in order to escape predators. It, it was. It's almost like, you know, they're, I wish I could escape predators. What can I do? Oh, I know, I'll grow wings. That's not how it works, is it? Um, evolution is, isn't goal-directed. It isn't intentionally directed. Um, as, as Noble writes, uh, to describe the state of affairs, there is no actual selection carried out by natural selection. We're not actually picking, you know, yeah, wings, those would be useful. That's not what's actually happening. Nature, in this case, is simply a passive filter. We have birds, 
They develop any number of different things. Wings, horns, tusks, uh, whatever, right? Third eyes, you know. And the ones that give them an advantage are the ones that stick around. So forget the, the horns, forget the tusks, but the wings, they provide you the advantage, they stick around. Evolution is the filter, not the selection mechanism. The selection is at random. So, the suggestion is maybe that picture is not right either. And this is where Dennis Noble comes in. He says, well, maybe there is a role of agency in evolution. Um, and there are different ways we can look at this, and we'll explore some of these. But uh, if you think about it, entities that have agency might be like birds that have wings. They might be more capable of survival. So the origin of agency might be evolution. Certainly something worth considering. Um, okay, what do we mean by that? Well, let's go back to what we think of as the control system that Alan Newell talked about. Because that's kind of what we're talking about, except that maybe it isn't, right? So, what does a universal theory of control have to entail? Well, there's an awful lot of stuff in here. Uh, Newell lists the following. Behave flexibly as a function of the environment. Exhibit adaptive behavior. Operate in real time. Operate in rich, complex, detailed environments. Use symbols and abstractions. Use language. Learn from the environment and from experience. Acquire capabilities through development. Uh, operate autonomously, but within a social community. Be self-aware and have a sense of self. Be realizable as a neural system. Be constructible by an embryological growth process and arise through evolution. Now, the question here we ask is, do we need all of this in order to have agency? Well, no. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of the, the non-representationalist, non-cognitive approaches will say. And, and in particular, uh, it's the prescriptive things, like use symbols and abstractions and use language, um, or even operate within a social community. Um, these seem to be optional. Others seem to be uh, a requirement insofar as we're talking about humans, like be realizable as a neural system or be constructible by an embryological growth process, right? That's kind of contingent on being human. But we, we could maybe imagine something realizable as a connectionist system constructed by human computer constructors, say. Um, some might be epiphenomenal. Um, they might arise as a consequence of having agency, but not be essential to it. For example, being self-aware and having a sense of self or operating in real time. Um, you know, perhaps that might be the case. Uh, these might happen because a system has agency, but they might not actually be a part of agency itself. Um, and then others might be uh, what we might call performative requirements, like behave flexibly, adaptive behavior, operating in rich, complex environments. These are performative requirements, right? 
these are based on a concept of agency as well as power perhaps or as competencies so i think that the theory based on a theory of control or a theory of executive function is bringing a lot more into the picture than we need in order to have agency in a person, in an animal, in a thing. Okay, well, what do we actually need? One way of getting at this is offered by Maslow's hierarchy. Um, and I think most people are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. And what's useful about it is that it gets at the idea that there are needs, survival needs, that are met by means of agency. So what are these survival needs? Uh, it's tempting to talk simply about basic physiological needs, air, water, food, shelter, etc. But as Maslow points out, um, as organisms become more complex, and especially they become more social, uh, the needs expand as well. So there are physiological needs, there are safety needs, but then there are needs that are more characteristic of social beings, like love and belonging. And then there are needs that are more characteristic of uh, beings that are self-aware, needs like respect, self-esteem, status, etc. And then finally, self-actualization. Um, we could ask whether this is actually a hierarchy. We could ask whether some of these are actually needs. I know a lot of people aren't really expressive of the need for self-actualization um, and you know even that seems to suggest some sort of directionality that, that a lot of people don't necessarily have um, and some of these might be more desires than needs we might desire respect but is it true that we need it in order to survive well maybe for some people but for everybody but the main point here, we shouldn't be lost, is that entities have needs. And these needs can vary from very simple to very complex. Um, and these needs can vary in intensity. Um, they can vary in the way they are actualized, etc. Another way of talking about the same sort of thing might be to try to get it to the most basic components possible. So here we have Brizio and Turassa in 2016 beginning with a model of agency based on some very basic needs and they, they basically draw out two basic needs one of them is coherence um, for something to actually be an organism it needs to have what they say is a substantially harmonious anatomic and functional structure um, there, there are different ways of, of thinking about that you know, particularly if we think about uh, entities that are non-human, like uh, social organizations or, or computers or whatever. So having a substantially harmonious anatomic and functional structure might not mean, you know, have a cell wall or have a skin. But it does mean to have some kind of structure such that uh, we as observers might say, yeah, that's a thing. 
And it, you know, and again, I'm, I've kind of changed a little bit their definition. Their definition is based on what it is. My definition is based on what we would call it. Um, but nonetheless, the core aspect of that is the same. The other thing is autonomy. Uh, and autonomy is described by them as living organisms create and maintain an internal environment which follows dynamics of its own. And I find this really interesting because autonomy here now is not talked about with reference to the external world in the sense of what it can do in the external world. It's, you know, it's not based on it can go where it wants, it can do what it wants. It's basically the idea that the entity, well, you know, creates and maintains an internal environment. Um, it is self-contained and its internal behavior is internally defined. It's, you know, now, strictly speaking, there's no such a no such entity. Um, if there were, then perpetual motion would be a thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but all entities have inputs and outputs of some sort. Um, you know, to have an internal environment um, that is not completely static, like the internal state of a rock, you require energy, um, which very often means matter, which is converted to energy in some way or another, like decomposition or whatever. Um, and I don't know of any such process that doesn't also produce waste, so input and output, right? But what's definitive of something that has agency, something that has autonomy, is that uh, their internal states are not 100% defined by the input and the output. I'll put it that way. So, for example, in the case of a cell, the internal structure of the cell is determined by the DNA, which is, you know, the, the, the blueprint of how it is created. And then how that DNA express, is expressed in the world will depend on input and output, but the internal environment isn't based 100% on that input and output. So, with some caveats, then, we can talk about agency as being minimally based on coherence and autonomy. You know, I'm just floating a theory here. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's true. What matters is, is this a good way of thinking about it? Or, no. What matters is, can we think of it this way? And then we'll sweat the details later. Um, because the point now can be made, coherence and autonomy are things that we could reasonably expect through, say, an evolutionary process. Um, there are also things that we could expect reasonably uh, in non-human entities. So this allows us to have non-human and and you know, even self-created or, or naturally created things that have agency that aren't us. So what does it take to maintain coherence and autonomy? So Brizio and Teresa continue. First of all, we create and maintain a permeable separation between the internal environment and the external milieu. We exploit features of the environment relevant to the organism and perhaps we exploit the biological behavior for example features of other individuals 
and then there are some organizational archetypes we can look at that describe how this sort of coherence and autonomy is maintained. Now again, creating and maintaining a permeable separation can be thought of in two ways. One way it can be thought of is as, you know, it's an essential property of the organism itself. It, it is a skin. It is an objective barrier. Or it can be thought of as uh, something more conceptual. Uh, where an external observer could say, oh yeah, I see that there is a boundary here um, between these things. Um, and part of agency, though, is that this boundary is maintained by the organism itself. So, like, for example, if you're, if you're driving through Canada from south to north, you're driving through a temperate forest for a while and then there's a really clear line where you cross that line and now you're into arctic forest so that's a boundary but it's not a boundary that's maintained by either of these forests it's a boundary that's created by the soil conditions the difference between canadian shield and sedimentary deposits and by climate um, by contrast the skin of a person or the cell wall of a cell, these are actually maintained by the organisms themselves. So the maintenance of the boundary is an important aspect of agency. Uh, to have agency, you, you need to be a distinct entity. And where this distinctness is created by and maintained by yourself. Okay. But we, we can still say that of all kinds of things, right? You know, I use the phrase distinct entity very deliberately because uh, in Canada we have this idea of Quebec, or at least Francophone Quebec, as a distinct society. And it is a distinct society, not because I say it is, um, but because that society itself maintains that it is a distinct society so it's generating its own agency it's generating its own coherence and autonomy by maintaining this separation we are a distinct society okay so take that idea the idea of agency as something that develops through evolution and with it the idea of agency as intimately connected with ethics and morality and you get the idea that morality could be thought of as a type of evolution now the headline there says social evolution because for our current discussion, we're still talking about culture and cultural practices. And in our current discussion, we're therefore thinking of ethics as something that is produced by a culture. And in particular, through the concept of agency in that culture. Um, so let's think about that. Uh, Robin Dunbar proposes something called the social brain hypothesis where and there's two sides to it. First of all, uh, there's the idea that because we live in a society, there is an evolutionarily or there is an evolutionary advantage to uh, as it's put here, uh, acquiring social intelligence. On the other hand, um, we could say that morality is something that evolves as our sense of agency evolves as we become more effective agents whoops 
we become more effective ethical beings. Uh, both of those are, are interesting approaches. Um, and interestingly, they, they, they kind of map to the, the ethical theories that we've already talked about. So, for example, uh, let's take three types of behaviors here, and they're listed here. Uh, moral acts, which correspond to the moral philosophy of consequentialism, which might be based on instinct and behavioral genetics. Moral motives or intent, and you notice that's a bit different, right? It's a lot different. The, the moral philosophy is very different. It's deontology, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and others. The biological science behind that is psychology and maybe neurophysiology. Then we have moral systems, the artifact of ethics. Um, the moral philosophy that that corresponds to is the social contract. And the biology that that may be related to is sociality and communication. And I think that's interesting. <clears throat> because now we have, remember we had the different types of agency. We have the different types of morality that almost kind of pretty much map to the different kinds of agency, right? Agency as power is consequentialism. Agency as Feeling or maybe capacities uh, corresponds with deontology. Agency as ownership corresponds with social contract. Arguably, each of those three things has an origin in the biological sciences and arguably, as a result, they develop through a process of evolution. So the argument here is that it's an evolutionary process that leads to different aspects of agency and leads to different aspects of ethics. And we can think of this either in terms of ourselves as physical objects, we can think of this as ourselves as cognitive entities, or we can think of this as ourselves as collectives like societies or governments or agencies there's a, an evolutionary theory for everyone so there's been a lot of work done on this and uh i found this chart on an article in biomed central uh that looks at the evolution of morality um and this one Let's look at some of the, the, the elements of ethics that, that this chart picks out. And I find this sort of odd, but uh, innate learned distinction, that is ethics as an innate versus a learned distinction. Uh, relevance of learning to morality, only one study picks up on that. Kin selection seems to be very important to people. Reciprocal altruism is important to some people. Cultural evolution, the idea of a culture... Uh, being subjected to similar, similar evolutionary processes. Uh, rewards, sanctions, nobody's interested in that, which I find is interesting. Nature, nurture, caveat, mentioned by a bunch of people. Emergent properties, maybe mentioned by one. And then discussion of a reductionist bias, mentioned by, well, about half of them. So, all I want to say here is, even if we say, morality is something that's evolved through something like the well-known theory of evolution our understanding of it is still all over the map um, but it's interesting the relation between biology and knowledge especially once we start saying well uh, you know, there's a relation between how we came to be, what our, what our nature is, what our biology is, 
and what we can come to know, what we can come to believe, what we can come to feel is right or wrong. And there's a bit of a danger here, and Ben Williams, Ben Williamson points us to them, points to a couple of areas uh, where you know, the, the ethical risk seems greater than the actual benefit. So let's look at them briefly. Well, on one hand, a data-intensive, bioinformatics-driven approach to education remains in development, basically using a person's genome to identify their learning needs and potential. Now, even if we agree that agency and knowledge, etc., or even you know our capacities are biologically determined. This sort of approach is the sort of approach that I defined earlier as control learning, right? Uh, and there's a difference, I think, between uh, determining what a person's biological state is and then defining what their education should be based on that versus having a biological state and being that biological entity determining for yourself what your education will be. Two very different things. And there are substantial ethical risks in trying to derive a person's, eth or a, a person's educational needs from their biology. I think that should be evident by an examination of those two models. Because really it, it takes, again, the agency out of the equation. A person can't do anything about their biology. So they're completely passive in this environment, which means all of the ethical responsibility falls on the bioinformatics-driven approach. The second thing, a set of affect-aware technologies to gauge and respond to student emotional states that aims to make emotional life machine readable and to control, engineer, reshape, and modulate human behavior. Again, same kind of thing except instead of using biological information to uh, manage a person's education, we're using emotional uh, and cognitive states to manage a person's education. Same risks apply. And as an aside, this is where I think a lot of the objection to learning styles theory comes in. Because learning styles are thought of as being applied in the same way right you look at somebody's learning styles you study it through a test maybe uh, you find out that they're INFP or whatever and then you shape the education they will receive based on that learning style and the argument is on the part of the critics that there's no improvement in their educational outcomes based on that method um, and that seems to make sense to me. Um, similarly, it makes, it seems equally likely that neither of these two projects that Ben Williamson describes would produce differences in outcomes either. Um, it doesn't follow from that, though, that there are no, um, bioinformatics about a person. It doesn't follow from that that there are no student emotional states and it doesn't follow from that that there are no learning styles. The, the, the response is out of proportion to uh, the criticism. But the problem isn't in the learning styles. The problem is in the model of learning that is based on the idea that you can do some kind of set of measurements or evaluation or determination of the physical state of a person and determine for them what they need. And it's a problem 
not because you can't do it. It's a problem because you have now assumed an ethical responsibility that you can't fulfill. Um, even if you can shape the outcome, you are not in a position to know that this is the right outcome. Um, you don't have that ethical capacity to make that call. Why? Well, again, we go back to the ethics of care and all of that. The people who it involves are the only people who have the right to make that call. All right? Agency is necessary for ethics, but agency is also essential, or, or ethics is essential to agency. Ah, try to say that. In the written version, I'll, I'll express that better. But the idea again here is that uh, a person is responsible for their own learning only if they have control over their own learning. Um, we could think of agency as a way a culture evolves. Now, this is an idea of agency as something that is socially constructed, we could say. Um, that there isn't really a thing out there called agency. Uh, even if we can reduce it to things like basic elements of coherence and autonomy. And we can point to the objective existence of coherence and autonomy. But really, we've built this set of artifacts around that as a society, which are perhaps expressed by the, uh, the conditions that Alan Newell describes. You know, it's perhaps described as uh, this executive function. But this executive function, properly so-called, is a cultural construct. And that's where we get points of view like Kim Sterenley's quote, human life ways depend on cognitive capital that has typically been built over many generations. This process of gradually of, of gradual accumulation produces an adaptive fit between human agents and their environments. An adaptive fit that is the result of hidden hand evolutionary mechanisms. A bunch of stuff's going on here. So, one thing we have is this idea of cultural evolution. Now, cultural evolution is tricky um, if we apply it directly to, you know, if we apply the analogy directly to culture, then basically cultural evolution is the survival of the fittest applied to cultures, which means that the cultures that survived were, by that fact, the fittest. Which kind of runs counter to our intuition that you can't really compare cultures that way. It's not a case that they're competing for survival. Um, although, you know, I mean, certainly there's this, you know, this strong streak of social Darwinism that, that runs through society. Um, and the idea that, you know, not just cultures, but say languages or other cultural aspects, um, you know, everything from, from games to social mores to types of democratic organization, all of these are in some way, um, shaped by this survival of the fittest. The other thing that's going on here is the idea of the, the hidden hand, which as we know is a reference to Adam Smith's 
hit in hand of the marketplace. Again, the marketplace is depicted as something that's competitive. And so, once again, you have the idea of culture as evolving as a consequence of competition. Um, there are other ways of looking at this. But, uh, you know, we have this model. So we have, you know, a, a contrast here. The human genetics, which is simply the relationship between parents and the offspring. But then human culture, which has all kinds of influences on the offspring as a result of their peers, social norms, parents, relations, etc. Um, and the question that comes up is, is actual evolution of properties like agency the result only of the one type of evolution, the human genes type of evolution, or is it also a product of cultural evolution? Well, the idea that it is, is known as the dual inheritance theory. So, dual inheritance theory models cultural evolution, I'm reading here, closely on genetic evolution and cultural inheritance closely on biological inheritance. The central idea is that there are features of human psychology, most obviously imitation learning and language, and features of human social environments, most obviously long periods of juvenile dependence, that result in a high fidelity flow of ideas from parents to their offspring. Um, and I find this an interesting theory, and I find this a dangerous theory, to be quite frank. Um, because, it, again, it's not clear to me that cultural survival is the same as uh, biological survival. And it's not clear to me that the same mechanisms are in place, the same mechanisms that would inform one inform the other. But also, too, the way this picture is drawn, you have a mechanism to go from what the culture is around to the individual survival of the organism. And so you, you get the idea that some psychological traits, um, say imitation learning, are the result of cultural factors. I have a bit of a hard time with that. Um, but I can't prove that it's not true either. Um, an instance of this, um, yeah, I, I guess I could use the word an instance of this, is the idea of um, the inheritance or, you know, the cultural or the evolution of memes. You know, Richard Dawkins, for example, writing about the selfish gene. Um, or Susan Blackmore, mimetics does provide a useful way of understanding cultural evolution. So, both dual inheritance and meme-based theories share the idea that cultural transmission is both important and accurate. Okay. Dawkins calls the information that is copied the replicator and contrasts this with the vehicles that carry the replicators. So, the vehicle would be a human and the, the idea, the information, he says, in my view, misusing the word information, but that's in the side, um, that's the replicator, the thing that becomes replicated. Uh, for example, Garfield loves lasagna. So humans carry the idea that Garfield loves lasagna. The idea that Garfield loves lasagna competes against other ideas out there in the world um, and the most fit of those ideas survives. 
Now, on the dual inheritance theory, it's the biological fitness of the human agents that explains the spread of these memes or of cultural variants, right? But most of culture can't be explained that way. Uh, as, as we could ask, what is the fitness for a short melody? Uh, is it the ability to survive and reproduce? Um, there's so much of culture that really has nothing to do with the survivability of the humans in that culture. Including the idea that Garfield loves lasagna, right? A person that believes or at least contains the idea Garfield loves lasagna is neither more or less likely to survive than a person that doesn't. And the idea itself that Garfield loves lasagna has no more eminent survivability than the idea that Garfield loves pizza. Right? So the theory just doesn't seem to apply. And I think the reason why it doesn't apply is because the model of competition for survival is itself incorrect when it comes to culture. Uh, this whole picture is kind of questionable, but I, I need to bring it out here. To make it clear so uh th this image it shows up all over the place i got this one from douglas alchin uh in the article teaching the evolutionary uh, sorry the evolution of morality status and resources um and it's this kind of it's not reductionist but it's sort of reductionist model of how evolution maybe applies to each of the different levels of entities in the world from matter to life to mind or psychology to culture and we could talk about these as as daniel dennett does um as, as you know different levels or domains of discourse we could for example when talking about mind take what he calls the intentional stance and we could for example talk about culture by talking about the social stance but when we begin making inferences up and down this chart here from culture to mind from mind to life from life to matter and even vice versa, that's when things become a bit questionable. Um, because there's no reason to believe, for example, that statements that we make about culture are reducible to statements that we could make about mind. For example, language as Wittgenstein showed, is a property of culture. It's a thing that exists out there in the world. It does not follow from that that language also exists in the mind. It certainly does not follow that language also exists in biology or that it exists in matter. Um, you know, I mean, quarks don't behave the way propositions do we could perhaps impose a requirement of coherence on all of this, or perhaps even say, create a semantics of culture to mind, a semantics of mind to life or something like that to draw relations between them. But this becomes a very tricky enterprise. Um, it's not clear, certainly, that this enterprise helps us understand the concept of agency, first of all, and the concept of morality, generally. Um, you know, and, and Douglas Alchin, here's the criticism. 
the ultra reductionism and implicit promotion of competition that once dominated the field yielded to more balanced perspectives and more nuanced interpretations. Reductionistic bias varies, but the texts basically omit the concept of emergent properties or new levels of organization at the, physio or at the psychological and social levels. They do not, for example, describe how social rewards or sanctions can regulate, quote, selfish behavior or individual, quote, cheating, as, for example, observed in food sharing among vampire bats. Um, and that's the weakness of using an evolutionary account of agency. It's not clear that evolution explains agency. Because it's not clear that agency is based in reduction. You know, it's not clear that we can reduce agency to biological properties. And more to the point, it's not clear that agency is an inherently competitive thing. Uh, our agency does not entail competition with other agents. And when we look at agency, um, as, you know, as, as a tool of morality, maybe tools the wrong word there, uh, we're looking at it not as something that develops naturally on its own out of evolution and survival of the fittest and competition and all of that. Again, this is a lesson that the ethics of care teaches us. Um, agency, insofar as it is described as power or described as capabilities or feelings or ownership, is instantiated or expressed differently in different people depending on their own conditions. And it's the sort of thing that if we want it to exist, which if we're interested in ethics, we want agency to exist, then it needs to be supported in some way. And that's why this whole module is about ethical practices. What are the practices that we would undertake to support agency to allow people to develop their own ethics and not just make up ethics, but actually develop ethics? Well, based on something I wrote a while back called What Peace Means to Me, uh, this was based on my experience listening to stories uh, of people who were impacted by the war in Colombia, describing what the war took away from them. And what it took away from them was their agency. And so I came up with these things based on that, that describe the sorts of things that we should be supporting that support agency. Now again, it's it's a two-dimensional thing. Uh, it's not a deep theory or anything like that, but it's a first blush look at the kind of practices that we could undertake socially that support agency and therefore support uh, ethics ethics in individuals, and, and maybe even ethics in AI. Well, I, I need to argue for that. So the first of this is security. And the people who are in these war environments said, basically, the first thing they take away from you is your sense of security. Uh, three ways of doing this, by directly, directly threatening violence, or by threatening your sense of ownership or your relations over property or people you love. 
or the threat that somebody else will inflict violence either against you or against your property that's that's a subtle one that's the idea of inventing an enemy that might harm you in order to take away your sense of security because you don't feel secure you feel compelled to comply you lose your agency and to my mind maybe i'm wrong here but to my mind the only response to this is to remove the effectiveness of violence to make it not possible for people to harm you harm your property harm your your business your loves etc um, and that is based in solidarity or trust in community i think it's a hobbesian argument isn't it uh, we form a society in order to secure ourselves. That part seems to be true. Now, in forming a society, we, we have the capacity of doing more harm than good. But the first instinct is a good one. Second thing they take away is identity. Um, identity is... I'm maybe saying right is too strong, but identity is the capacity to define and to be who you are. Uh, but they said, war reduces each and every one of us to one thing, a tool of one side or another for fighting the war. This is something that we've observed. Uh, I read A Long Way Gone. I watched Blood Diamond, the whole story of child soldiers. Um, it seems to me to be powerful evidence of this and when you become a tool for fighting the war then conformity becomes mandatory there's a range of conformity but minimally you need to identify yourself as being on one side rather than the other whether through face markings or those little tufts that go up or the wings on the winged hussars, whatever. Uh, speak the same languages or the same codes, often supporting the same religions. But it's not just conformity, it's obedience, right? You are a tool, you will obey. And, and you no longer have agency, you are no longer responsible, morally responsible for the outcome. And we saw that, right? in the Nuremberg trials where people say well I was just following orders because they believed they no longer had agency the only thing they could do was follow orders so you know by the time you've lost your identity in this way it's almost too late and, and perhaps external intervention is required of some sort um, and the time to prevent this is before this happens um, by protecting and promoting the right to define and to be who you are, either as an individual or as a culture, as in the case of the distinct society of Quebec. Um, or as in the language speakers, right? You know, the people who speak speak. I don't know, French. The third is voice. And voice is more than just making noise, although it certainly is making noise. Uh, it's part of the expression of identity, but it's also the mechanism that we use to create community, develop ideas, uh, create future visions, possibilities, etc. It's how, if you will, we actually create this cohesion uh, that allows us to have individual agency and also collective agency. Voices, as they say, the right to a say. And it's not just the expression of an opinion, but the idea that what you say can and will be measured and weighed. And again, in the ethics of care, um, the person who has the say first and foremost is the person who will be most impacted by whatever is being talked about and also the person who 
has the least agency, the least power, right? Because you're trying to promote agency and power or agency or the, the, the feeling of agency, the feeling of self-efficacy, the feeling of ownership over the outcome of something. Uh, and this means that people need to learn to have their voice. Um, I mentioned this earlier when I talked about autonomy. People need to learn how to be autonomous. Similarly, people need to learn to self-organize, to make decisions, resolve disputes, etc. So promoting this is to promote support for people who are trying to learn these things. Finally, opportunity. Um, and this, by this, what we mean is a path or at least the potential for a path to get you from where you are to what you aspire to achieve. This is the actual idea of free learning as opposed to control learning. Uh, the idea that you can actually choose, or even better, not choose, but forge or create this path for yourself. Uh, people who will have their opportunity denied to them in this way aren't at peace. And, and this is something I think that it's important to recognize. When we have an environment of control learning, when we have an environment where we have an artificial intelligence, say, or an educational institution, or even a teacher, no matter how ethical and how benign, actually making all the decisions for the person, their opportunity has been eliminated their ability to go where they want to go rather than where their instructor or AI wants them to go. And it puts them in a position of struggle against them, inevitably. Well, maybe not inevitably, but, but frequently. I don't want to say inevitably, because nothing really is inevitable. So what needs to happen especially for people in marginalized or vulnerable groups is support for self-determination support for um, them being able to do whatever it is that they want to do there are caveats on that we'll leave that aside but the idea here is that instead of directing them instead of telling them what they ought to do these mechanisms support them in what they believe themselves is the right thing to do. And so that requires an infrastructure, an educational system uh, of the appropriate sort, but also, you know, all the rest of society. Uh, for example, a commercial infrastructure that is robust and trustworthy. Uh, didn't, and it's funny, you know, it's these are the sorts of things that enable agency. And it's this agency that enables people to be, quote unquote, self-made men, right? Um, but without this opportunity, without a social infrastructure that actually allows them to pursue these objectives, their pursuit of these objectives would be impossible. I'm going to wrap up the section on agency by looking at Jose Restrepo's Four Steps to Peace. And this again was presented in Colombia at the same session uh, that I attended um, with the survivors of the conflict. Uh, again, like my thing, it's not authoritative, it's not deep, it's intended to provide a framework or a mechanism for thinking about these ideas. Um, you know, and to outline the sorts of practices that might be uh, the sorts of things that we want in order to foster a more ethical approach to analytics and AI. So, uh, these are the paths to peace. First of all, redistribution. Um, you know, for example, scholarships for students from low-income families and areas of conflict and increased capacities in communications, information, technologies, learning. Uh, 
there's a lot of discussion about the whole ethics of redistribution. Um, there's, there's two actual major ways of thinking of redistribution. One is to take away what people already have, um, their house, their money, their possessions, whatever. Um, you know, basically an act of expropriation of some sort. The other is to take away something that was potentially theirs but never actually became theirs. And this is what taxation does. Uh, this is what management and control over public property such as, as mineral resources or hydroelectric resources or uh, lumber or whatever. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's interesting, the, the psychological effects of the two mechanisms of redistribution are different, not surprisingly, because when the government comes and takes stuff from you, that impacts you very differently from when the government simply pre prevents you from taking more. And I think that might reflect some of the objection that some people feel to taking the money of the very rich and making it the money of the very poor, you know, why they would represent that as a kind of theft. But preventing them from ever getting the money in the first place is very different. And it's true that some people can feel that they have an ownership over these opportunities, an ownership over these revenue streams. But the sense of theft isn't as strong there as it is an outright seizure of property for redistribution. In any event, um, it's certainly an area of discussion because, you know, we live right now in a world that is very unbalanced in terms of uh, income, skills, capacities, access to power, access to resources, etc. Um, and there is very good argument for redistribution, not just to preserve the peace or to, to win the peace in conflict areas, but just in general, in society in general. Recognition is a second one. Um, and recognition is raised uh, in, in a lot of social, political, and ethical contexts. Uh, for example, in discussions of gender equity and diversity, uh, promoting things like uh, remembrance, of truth, and reconciliation. Um, recognition. Uh, you know, I put here a focus on training of indigenous communities and ex-combatants, and, and even that isn't really how I want to say it. Um, because recognition isn't the result of training. It, it's something different. Um, recognition, well, I mean, Charles Taylor talks about two types of recognition, and this is, this is where some of the, the distinction and some of the difficulties come up. First of all, recognition of dignity and this is the idea of a person as an ethical agent, um, a means, or sorry, an end rather than the means. Um, and that carries with it the sense that everybody should be treated the same. At least that's how it's expressed, right? The same rules should apply to everyone. But there's also recognition in the sense of recognizing differences, different culture, different heritage, different language, different belief system, and respecting that. Um, and that the, the two are at odds with each other, or at least, you know, is, they seem to be at odds with each other. Um, they seem to suggest that we can't do both. We can't treat everybody the same, but treat some people as different. 
uh, I personally think this is a fairly narrow view because, of course, there are ways to treat people the same and to treat them differently. Um, because treating a person, quote unquote, isn't a single thing. It's a whole set of things. So um, we can treat everybody as being governed by the speeding laws on the highway. Even in cases of emergency, you, you can't go above the speed limit. Um, but you can give some people special privileges on the highway, like high occupancy vehicle lanes or bus lanes. So here we have a case of we're recognizing everybody, you know, the dignity of everybody, the right of everybody to be safe on the highway by virtue of the fact that nobody speeds, but also the recognition that different classes of people, different groups of people, have different needs and different rights to different parts of the roadway. So, and the trick here is making that work. Um, you know, and there, there's, you know, I mean, Charles Taylor wrote a whole book about the politics of recognition, which I can't even come close to summarizing, much less the much wider discussion. But there is a sense that you have to recognize the other person as equal in order to have, in order to, well, no, I don't want to say it like that. You have to recognize both the dignity and the distinctness of the other if the other is to have agency, if the other is to, in your eyes, have ethical standing. Representation, working together to promote, and this is, this is again the, the way of promoting peace in Colombia that was suggested, working together to promote interdisciplinary research to develop capacity to rebuild society, sharing curricula on human rights and writing textbooks to teach new generations. That's kind of the control learning way of doing it. Representation to me is to answer the question, who speaks for us, right? Um, I don't always speak for myself and, and I won't always be able to speak for myself because my interests, my capacity for agency is projected into many places where I have no knowledge, no influence, no nothing. Um, you know, some aspects of tax policy, for example, that I don't even know exist, um, nonetheless require my representation. So who speaks for me? Um, you know, the, the idea in representative democracy is that I have a voice in choosing the people who speak to, for me. Um, and to the extent that they do actually speak for me, I consider that system to be more democratic. It's kind of funny how that works. And, and you know, again, thinking about these things as socially constructed, how we've taken the idea of democracy to be such that one person speaks for a group of people who are organized together by virtue of living in the same place. That's an odd concept. Uh, I would have thought that the one speaking for the people would have been people organized by virtue of agreeing on something, right? And then you don't have the scenario where the person representing you actually says the opposite of something you believe. It's the sort of thing that we need to think about and consider. But representation isn't only about governance and control. Representation is also about who conveys the idea of what it is or who it is that I am out there to the rest of the world. 
So, for example, we have media representations of culture, um, which can be quite damaging to the culture um, by the perpetuation of stereotypes or mistaken beliefs, or, you know, even substituting their own voices, their own views, uh, or even their own selves for representations of that culture over and above the members of that culture themselves. And that's how we got, you know, the scenario of uh, white people playing Indians or Japanese people in the movies, right? Um, the right to be represented was simply taken away from these communities, at least in, in these contexts, and given to somebody else. Representation ultimately means people being able to determine for themselves who speaks for us or who speaks for me. <clears throat> I'm running out of voice here. Reconciliation, finally, is the mechanism of well, promoting peaceful conflict resolution and alternative paths to success, self-expression and community support. There are different processes in different societies that have been used. Apologies, memorials, truth-telling, amnesties, trials and punishment, lustration, which if you wondered, as I did, means vetting people who are seeking political office today with respect to the things that they did while they had political office in the past. Uh, reparations, forgiveness, and participation in deliberative processes. So these things, again, are all practices, cultural practices that can promote agency and therefore promote a society's capacity or the members of a society's capacity to define for themselves and to be responsible for the ethics or the morality in that society. Um, this gives us this concept of shared agency. Um, and that's an important concept in the sense that it allows for things that are not necessarily individual human beings to have moral standing. Now, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of care that has to be taken here um, because shared agency implies shared responsibility and if responsibility is accompanied with punishment, you have shared punishment or the, in other words, the phenomenon of collective punishment. Um, the sins of the father shall be visited upon the sons, right? Um, or the idea of, you know, uh, punishing a whole society for the misdeeds of some people in that society. It's considered a war crime. Um, but at the same time, we want to allow for the possibility of, that a culture or a people or a nation or a community can, you know, express some sort of shared shared agency. Um, and it's not simply, uh, as, as Roth says in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it's not simply the aggregation of individual acts um, rather, it's the structure of, of interaction among those individuals, a uh, structure that has a distinctive normative significance for those individuals with an impact most immediately on each individual's intention-based practical reasoning. It's the fact of being associated with other people in a certain way and the resulting behavior on the part of that person as a part of that agency or as a part of that, that organization that creates 
shared agency. Um, we could extend this maybe to ethics and analytics. Maybe we can have something like a shared agency between a human and a computer. Or maybe an artificial intelligence could have a shared agency as a representative, as a group of people on whose behalf it is acting. Um, but it doesn't follow that. It's responsible for anything over and above the specific conditions of that shared agency. So if, for example, it went off and did something on its own uh, that was not sanctioned by the groups, by the people that it represents, it doesn't follow that uh, it alone is responsible. It doesn't follow that the people are responsible. I mean, there, there are questions here of who is the actual agent? Um, where is the ownership? Where is the power? Um, you know, where is the capacity located? I know all this was pretty complex and, and often not directly related to ethics and artificial intelligence. But I think it was important to have this discussion because we cannot talk about ethics without talking about agency for the reasons I've outlined here. And when we start talking about agency, we start getting into complexities that aren't really covered by the ethical theories involved, uh, you know, consequentialism, deontology, and the rest, because of the many different flavors of agency that exist. And it's also important because not only humans have agency. Um, we can talk about the ethical standing of animals. You know, who among you hasn't said good dog, right? Um, we can talk about the ethical standing of organizations like companies or nations or cultures. Um, but that understanding comes with the caveat that you know, as ethical agents, they have or need to be allowed to have those properties that constitute things that can have agency. At a minimum, coherence and autonomy. And maybe, depending on how we construct our concept of agency, rather more. And this does allow us to assign agency to things like artificial intelligence. But the extent to which we assign ethical responsibility to artificial intelligence only exists to the degree that we allow artificial intelligence to take agency away from us. And to my mind, the best mechanism for defense against unethical uses of not just AI or analytical power, but corporate power, institutional power, etc., is to refuse to allow these to take away from our own individual agency. Now, that does not dissolve into an Ayn Rand individual all against all kind of thing. We looked at the idea of agency as an evolutionary concept based on survival of the fittest, but that's a concept that doesn't work for a variety of reasons. It's not clear that cultural phenomena all reduce to a struggle for survival of the fittest. Um, it's not clear that 
cultural values or social values can be reduced to individual values. Um, there is, you know, it's, it's not a reductionist thing. Uh, a culture can have a property that is not the property of any given individual. For example, um, a culture can have a history that extends centuries, whereas the history of an individual only applies for years, and so on. Um, and the properties that a culture has, things like language, things like laws, um, things like the capacity to move mountains, uh, are not the properties that an individual has. An individual does not possess a language the way a culture does. An individual does not possess knowledge the way a culture does. They're two different kinds of things. They can both have agency, but talking about the agency of an individual is distinct from talking about the agency of a culture. And we need to be careful not to blend you know, the, the biological with the social in that way. Um, you know, we can use the metaphor of the body politic. But the politic is literally not a body. It is something distinct. And that's why our discussion of ethics is not going to be exhausted by a discussion of culture. Uh, or for that matter practices or, or regulations, etc. Um, the discussion of ethics ultimately is going to come down to the discussion of the individual person, we ourselves, and how we come to have ethics at all and what that means and how that informs us with respect to our interactions with our culture, with our social, political, technological frameworks, with the law and with the rest of the world. That's the subject of the next and final set of discussions in this course. Um, and to them we turn. But for now, thanks for joining me. I'm Stephen Downs. I'll see you next time.